morning, everyone. Now you can't see me yet. That's because I'm not on the platform. Getting there. Hold on a second. Good morning and welcome to the covenant this morning. It's going to be a little bit different with me being the only one in the room today. But uh, we did have uh, someone in our school and church, Darren Stockett, that ended up getting uh, testing positive for COVID. Or to take precautionary measures to keep everyone safe. We fully cleaned the entire church on Friday evening, and there might be other carriers. We didn't have an outbreak or spread in our church. So you're sitting at home, and, uh, and I'm standing here, and, but God's got a plan, and it doesn't interrupt his plan, nor does it cease his message. Do pray for Darren as he's recovering. Pray for his family not to get sick as well, and uh, also keep Sean and Amy in your prayers. Amy's dad went home to be with Jesus this, uh, this past week, had a celebration for service for him yesterday, but um, it is never easy to have a parent uh, go homeward, even if you know that they're going to be with Jesus. So do keep them in prayer, keep the girls in prayer. Also, others who are, are facing illness and sickness, um, Rick Johnson being one who's still facing cancer and having good days and bad days, keep in prayer. I know there's others. I'm, I'm going to get to mention somebody, but um, please, uh, prayer. I also just today shared a video of my mom's testimony, uh, not the full testimony, but a portion of it, just to be an encouragement for those facing tough times in a battle, and I'll, I'll share it on this page as well. Uh, let me go ahead and open us up in prayer. Lord, we praise you and thank you for giving us this new day. And Lord, um, whether the, this week or the past few weeks have gone our way or not, that doesn't matter. Because our way doesn't matter. What matters is that we follow your way. And that, Lord God, you become Lord of life. You would be the one that would hold us fast, no matter the circumstance or situation. I, I just remember the lyrics to that Jenny Owens song that says, I'm going to walk through the fire. I want me to. But I'm not who I was when I took my first steps. And I'm holding to the promise that you're not through with me yet. But if all of these trials bring me closer to you, I will walk through the fire. If you... Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're a good father that loves us and cares for us. So do pray for your healing upon Darren. Lord God, pray for your healing touch upon Rick and encouragement for Sandy and the rest of the Woods and Smith family, Lord God, and Johnson family. Pray that you would continue to work in a powerful way in our homes and in our communities. You are the ruler of time and space, and whether or not we can meet in the same location or not this morning, I pray that you would meet. Amen. Let me encourage you as well to take the time, I, I share it on our Facebook page, and it's on our YouTube page, um, a playlist of worship songs. Uh, so if you haven't listened to that yet, take the time to, to listen and worship and praise the Lord. Don't miss out on that just because we're not meeting in person. Um, let me go over a couple announcements with you. Today we were supposed to have our annual church conference, and uh, that did not happen uh, due to what's been going on, and so we are going to be rescheduling that, so I encourage you guys to, uh, we'll be letting you know in the future when that's going to happen. We also have our, um, our four things, daily devotional, that's available to you online, and uh, so I encourage you guys to check that out as well. Um, that is a way to keep up to date with um, what we're studying on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Uh, it's a, an active way for you to read God every week so that you know what to read and pray and study and focus on. And so um, I encourage you guys, if you have a chance, to join in with that. That would be wonderful. Also this week, on Wednesday, we're having the food delivery truck from Health and Welfare Ministry. And so um, if you're able to come and help with that, I know we would uh, love to have the extra help. Also, food giveaways is coming Saturday, and the gates will be open at 8 o'clock, and we're going to continue to do the, the drive through setup we had, and so we need people to help stage it on Friday night, and also people to contribute on Saturday morning, and so if you're able to help with either of those, that would be wonderful. And then online giving with Tithely, 
uh, is still an option. Um, since we can't meet in person, uh, you can still mail uh, your tithes, love offerings to the church, or drop them by the church later, but tithely is an option for you as well. Okay, that's all that I had. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Today's message is entitled, The Baptism of the Holy Spirit. We saw last, last week how Paul has a vision beyond his life and earthly ministry as he pours himself out on several key individuals like Priscilla and Aquila. He takes them from Corinth. I'm going to put up a map for you of his second missionary journey. He takes them from Corinth, which is in Greece, and leaves them in Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey, the province of Asia, a place where Paul wanted to go directly on the second missionary journey. He wanted to go west, and God said no, and so he went north. And then, then when he wanted to head into Asia or, or head further north, God had him go west, but above the province of Asia, and then brought him into the ministry of Greece. And so this was a leading of the Holy Spirit. While Priscilla and Aquila are there in Ephesus, there's another believer that comes along from Alexandria in Egypt. His name is Apollos. Apollos is one of those guys that uh, you'd love to listen to. He's one of those guys that had a podcast today. You'd be listening in if preaching, if he was having a local speaking engagement. He just is passionate, he's enthusiastic, and he's a great teacher. Um, but Apollos has one flaw. He doesn't have the full gospel. His message ends with the baptism of John instead of including the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not that he wants to exclude the teaching of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't know about it. And so Priscilla and Aquila, instead of confronting him publicly about this and making a scene, pull him aside and talk to him privately and introduce him to the teaching of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the same teaching they received from Paul. After some time, Apollos feels this calling of the Holy Spirit to go to Corinth, the very same place where Paul met Priscilla and Aquila and worked with them at tent making. And while Apollos is in Corinth, he preaches the gospel powerfully and convincingly to the Jews in the synagogue. And so we see in this passage, what we saw last week, was how the ministry of Paul comes full circle. He had a calling to Asia, a desire for Asia. Lydia, the first person he ministers to as he crosses over uh, that expanse of water into, into Europe, is a person who's from the province of Asia. Now after training Priscilla and Aquila and working with them, he leaves them in Ephesus in the province of Asia to carry on the work that he desired to do at first. Now we see with Apollos, that same Jewish community in the synagogue in Corinth that Paul got so frustrated about that he wanted to shake the dust off his clothes and saying, I'm through with you, I'm done with you. God was using Apollos to teach and preach the gospel with passion in a way that would connect with them and they would understand. And so we see uh, that all these people and all their callings and placement in their ministry was because Paul didn't fight God's plan and path for his life. Everywhere he went, wherever God led him, whether it was where he wanted to be or not, he poured into the people that God brought across his path. And guys, how much do we miss out on when we're upset that we're not where we want to be? How many opportunities are you overlooking? How many people are you looking past because you'd rather be with other people? The gospel is for everyone because everyone is made in the image of God. And we're called to love people wherever we find ourselves. And so we see that everywhere the Holy Spirit led him, he found people hungry for truth and willing to follow Jesus, and he equipped them for the ministry. Now we pick up this week, um, uh, after Paul has finished visiting the key cities in Israel, he, he went from Ephesus and he made it back to Caesarea, spent some time in Jerusalem, went back to the sending church in Antioch, and then visited the churches that he helped to establish on the first missionary journey. Now we're picking up uh, him after visiting those churches where he goes next. And I'm going to go start reading in chapter 19, starting verse 1 through 6. It says, While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled there through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them? No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism 
of John. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Paul laid his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So here we see that Paul eventually makes his way back to Ephesus. Remember, when he went there the first time and left Priscilla and Aquila, they begged him to stay longer, and he says, I'll come back, the Lord willing. And so there's a sign of Christian maturity that we can see in this passage right away. It's that God rules Paul's desires. He recognizes that his desires are from God when it's ministry related. And, and, and he gives God the right and the freedom to lead wherever he wants, even if it contradicts at the moment his desire to be with a certain people or certain group. And so he says, I'll, I'll come back to you. I want to come back to you, but it's in the Lord's hands if the Lord's willing. And so now God has finally opened the door for Paul to minister in Asia, minister in Ephesus, and, uh, and extend that ministry. But after arriving and getting to know some of the believers, he begins to ask them about their baptism. Now, we don't know if, if uh, uh, um, Priscilla and Aquila had sent uh, messages to Paul saying, hey, this guy Apollos is going on here. He's teaching the baptism of John, which is wonderful. He's passionate about Jesus. He just doesn't know the Holy Spirit, and we we're trying to teach him about that. I, I don't know how much of a context. I don't know if it's just the Holy Spirit prompting him to say, hey, ask him about me. Either way, he talks to these believers in Ephesus and says, do you know anything about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When you were baptized, did you receive that? And their response to him is basically, who is the Holy Spirit? We haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. You know, that grieves my heart because I believe that there are churches in the United States. In fact, I know that there are churches in the United States that don't teach about the Holy Spirit. And uh, I've had people tell me that before. I've been to church my whole life, or I've been to this place and that place, and I've never gotten any solid teaching on the Holy Spirit. In fact, when I went to seminary, that was the person that I wanted to understand the most of the Trinity simply because it, 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 he is somewhat mysterious. And I think that's one of the reasons why there isn't more teaching on the Holy Spirit. It, it's tragic that it's not because it's so key to our faith. Um, the Holy Spirit, as we studied the, at the beginning of our study of Acts, is the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe, because the Bible says it, that God is one, and yet he's three persons in one. If you have trouble understanding that, there's lots of ways uh, throughout our world and science that helps us understand that concept. Water can be gas, liquid, or solid, and yet it's all still water. You know, in marriage, two people, two personalities, two individuals become one, and yet they're still individual persons. There's ways to understand that the best that we can in our culture and society. And so it's through the, the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit that we see in the Gospels, especially the, the Gospel of Luke, that, that Jesus is enabled to do a lot of the miracles he does. That the Holy Spirit leads Jesus in different places and at different times, taking him to different locations. And, and so we see that the Holy Spirit was key to Jesus' ministry. But even beyond that, even if you look at the book of Genesis, the first mention of God in Genesis is the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters of the, of the deep when there was just darkness. And, uh, and so the Holy Spirit is central to our faith as much as the Father and the Son. Um, when we get to the book of Acts, we see that the uh, apostles and the other followers uh, know what to do and, and know where to go and, and have the power to do what they're called to do because of the person and of the Holy Spirit. And so the power and the person of the Holy Spirit is key to the entire book of Acts. In fact, if you're just joining us in our study of Acts, um, look back, whether through our podcasts or previous sermon videos, start at the beginning, because our first teachings before we really jumped into Acts was clearly talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. A proper understanding of him is essential, understanding the book of Acts as a whole. And so the, the change in the followers of Jesus Christ and the book of Acts happens on the day of Pentecost when the new believers and the disciples receive the full person and presence of the Holy Spirit of their life. And, 
And so these guys that were afraid, were fearful, who betrayed Jesus, who abandoned Jesus, who, who just struggled with victory in their life, were so transformed that they spoke boldly in the name of Jesus. And uh, they were willing to face torture and rejection and imprisonment and all the rest. And so we see that, that the turning point in, in their life of, of having power and fulfillment and strength happens on that day of Pentecost. So if experiencing the best relationship with God comes from an understanding of the Holy Spirit's place in your life, and it's so essential, why aren't people? Why aren't people? Um, I would venture to say, because the Holy Spirit is somewhat mysterious. Um, you're talking about the supernatural, especially in our, our North American culture. We're so grounded in, 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 in our five senses and a study of science and trying to understand how everything works that, that the supernatural kind of intimidates us and scares us. And, and, and we, because it's, it's so otherworldly to us, it, we, we kind of shy away from that. I, I think another thing that keeps us from, from a, a deeper teaching on the Holy Spirit is the abuse of the teaching. I think we've all heard pastors or, or televangelists or, or evangelists or others who've used teaching of the Holy Spirit as, as a force to be wielded and, and so have used it to take advantage of people or create cults or whatever else. And so uh, because there's so much bad teaching out there, you get kind of gun shy as to someone that's teaching on the Holy Spirit. Um, another reason um, is, is the Holy Spirit is, is very... His description is very impersonal in some ways. You know, you have the other persons of the Trinity described as a son and as a father. Well, those are both things that we can wrap our mind around. We see it, we understand it. But Holy Spirit, or some translations say Holy Ghost, that is kind of hard for us to wrap our mind about. Why doesn't he have a proper title or an understanding for us to grasp? And so that's part of who he is. He, he is mysterious and otherworldly. And, and, and his humility, uh, he doesn't draw attention to himself. He's always pointing to the Father and the Son. And so he, he desires uh, an intimacy with you. But he has this mysterious quality to himself. So Paul explains clearly to these people the difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of the Holy Spirit that comes through Jesus. He tells them John's baptism is through repentance. It's water baptism. A realization that we're dirty and sinful and in need of someone to save us. It's a desire to be clean from the guilt and pain and consequence of sin. You know, John the Baptist wasn't the first to baptize people. If you understand Jewish history and even biblical history, you'll understand that when they were given the Levitical law, that there was times where they were unclean and so they had to cleanse themselves before they could be back in community. It was either because of sin or being around something dead or, or whatever else. But cleansing was part of their process in their culture. In fact, even during the time of Jesus, every community, every place, even outside the temple, there were these mikvahs, there were these places of baptism, places to cleanse yourself before you could go into the temple and worship, before you could be brought back into community. And so it was still established during the time of Jesus. Even tabernacle worship. The priest would wash themselves in the bronze basin before they could perform the sacrifice. And so the idea behind baptism is a, is a recognition of I am sinful. I am awful. My desires are wrong. My, my heart is desperately wicked. I, I can't fix myself. Everything I touch, I wreck. And so I need to be cleaned. I need to be cleansed. Just as in your body, when you're, when you're digging outside in the dirt or in the mud and you're aware of the dirt on your body and, and you've got to get it washed off, you're coming to God and saying, I can't get myself clean. You've got to do a deeper work in me. He's saying that was the, the teaching of John. This awareness of, of uh, needing to be cleaned and cleansed and, and be made whole and, and forgiven of sin. But there's more to it. The question is, what if you stopped? at the baptism of John. What if you stopped there and didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we know that Jesus 
has forgiven our sins, but we're left powerless to change. We're constantly aware of our dependence on God to forgive us, which is good, but there's no moving past a defeated life. Baptism, as I said, was already part of the culture and custom in the Jewish community before the coming of Christ. So it's something that they understood, something they desired. But there's that extra element. There was something about these disciples who spent every waking hour of Jesus on his three years of ministry that they still lacked after he ascended into heaven. There was a deeper work that needed to be done in them. And so if you have been following Jesus for for four months or four years or 40, and you've continued to, to live a defeated life where you just feel like you're in this cycle of sin and you can't get victory and you're fighting the same battles over and over and over again, it might be because you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the disciples at the Last Supper, the Holy Spirit, when He came, would convict the world of its sin. Boy, isn't that wonderful? John 16, 8 says this. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of its sin. It's not our job. We don't have the power to do it. I feel so bad for those that just struggle to to make people aware of their sin. The Holy Spirit's already doing it. He does that work, and He uses us to do that sometimes as well. The Spirit will guide us in all truth, bringing understanding of Jesus' teaching to our hearts from John 16, 13. He says, the Holy Spirit will remind you what I taught. He'll, 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 He'll bring that to the forefront. He'll establish those things in you. So there's an understanding of God's Word that comes, uh, uh, and it just doesn't become words on a page. It doesn't become just another book or or good thoughts. It becomes life to you. It becomes a a passionate breath, just like a a deep breath of oxygen. You know, right now when we have to wear masks everywhere, it feels so good, doesn't it, just to take off that mask and breathe without anything covering over our face. That's what God's Word is like when the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you. The Spirit will enable us to have power. Acts 1.8 says that. The Holy Spirit will come and bring you power. Right now, most of us feel very powerless in our world, in our culture. When we see wrong or injustice, we, we, we see problems everywhere and, and we just want to fix it. And it seems like nothing is getting fixed. The Holy Spirit has the power to change us first. And as we as individuals get changed and transformed and sold out to Him... The world changes one person at a time. And finally, in Luke 12, 11 and 12, it says the Holy Spirit will give us what to say when we face tough situations. Jesus says, listen, don't worry about what you're going to say. When you face confrontation or other things, I'll give you exactly what to say. And folks, sometimes, whether it's on social media or other things, I don't always post right away because I don't have the right words to say. I don't always am given the allowance to speak anything at all. You've got to learn to develop a pattern of saying, okay, Holy Spirit, what would you have me to say? When do you want me to say it? You don't have to worry about it. I want you to hear Paul's explanation in the book of Romans as to what the baptism of the Spirit looks like in the life of a new believer from Romans chapter 19, or chapter 1, verses 9 through 16. Um, I don't have the right scripture here, so I think I put it in wrong. Probably 19, 9 through 6. Let me read this to you. It says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. You have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For you live by its, if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. 
But you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Amen. You see what you're missing. If you don't have a full realization of a relationship with the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ died and rose to give you. I've said this before, but it's so true. Jesus didn't die for your sins and rise from the grave simply for you to get by on this life, to squeak into heaven, to live a defeated life here on this earth. If you spend so many of your days saying, I just wish Jesus would come back, you're probably not receiving the fullness of what God has for you every day. He died and rose again to endue you with power to live a victorious life. So life in the Holy Spirit looks like this. Like this. The Holy Spirit leads us where we need to go daily. What am I supposed to do today? Where am I supposed to go? How do I change my desires? You know, some of us, if we are honest with ourselves, we wake up every day thinking, what can I get away with today? How close can I get to the line? How can I get so close that I don't get caught? Where can I fulfill my wants and desires the way I want to? And and that's not life led by the Spirit. A life led by the Spirit is when we ask Him, God, I, I have my basic plan for today. It's Sunday. I think I know what I'm supposed to do. But you are Lord of my heart and life. What do you want me to do today? You do that throughout the day, and He will lead and guide you. Remember, everything that we study in the book of Acts, It just seems like coincidence, right? That Paul ends up at the right place in the right time, interacting with the right people. No. God is orchestrating everything. He's in control. And if he's leading, guiding you, and he's writing your story, and he's he's got the world in his hands, don't you think he can line you up with his perfect will and plan every day if the Holy Spirit is boss of your heart and life? Second thing is the Holy Spirit gives you a new life, quite literally. You weren't the same person you were before you gave him full control. You weren't the same person before your baptism in the Holy Spirit. We see this with Paul. Paul, a murderer, a persecutor of the church, someone who feels very justified in all these terrible actions that he's taking. But when he gives his life to Jesus and is baptized with the Holy Spirit, that zeal and passion that was against Jesus now is for him. And he's willing to face all those things he put other people through in order to follow Jesus and be led by the Holy Spirit. See the same change in Peter and others. And maybe you have seen that in other people's lives as well. The power of the Holy Spirit enables you to overcome the urges of your sinful nature and live victoriously. That's what this Roman passage is talking about. We can't live by the same urges and desires. And you may say, well, my experience tells me, no matter how long I've been a Christian, that that's still a problem. It may be because you continue to rely on your own power and strength to do it. You're different. You get to live by different rules. You have a different help, a different assist in your life, and it's Jesus. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit. He can change those desires. I really think that sin takes good desires and twists them and makes us think that we have to fulfill them that way. But when the Holy Spirit comes in your life, He changes your nature. He makes your nature new. He changes you from the inside out, quite literally. And all those passions and the desires that you have are fulfilled in Him. And then you don't, your desires change. Now this is a progress of time because sometimes we don't realize that we've received what we already have. And it takes time for us to realize what we have. Sometimes we have that in our relationships, right? We don't realize the kind of spouse that we've been given. We don't realize the the, the people in our life and how much they're there to benefit us and help us and walk alongside us. We don't utilize that relationship to the fullest. I think it's the same way with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you what to say when you need to say it. We've already mentioned that. And the Holy Spirit confirms in your heart that you are indeed adopted by God and that His promises are for you. Verse 15 and 16 says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when He adopted you as His own children. 
Now we call him Abba, Daddy, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. If you are in constant fear of whether or not you really are saved, whether or not you are really in relationship with Jesus Christ, whether or not you are really different, whether or not when you die today, you would know that you would go into heaven, the Holy Spirit brings you that affirmation that not only are you saved from the consequence of your sin, not only are you cleansed clean, but you are adopted sons and daughters of the eternal Heavenly Father. Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, this same city that Paul is doing this ministry in now, says this. It says, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he's promised us that he's purchased us as his own people, that he's done the work in us. So if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life, you will struggle with the power to overcome the temptations of your sinful nature. You're going to live with a defeated attitude, wondering if you're truly right with God, and you're going to struggle with where to go and what to say. Fear will be a real factor in your life. If that is you today, you may need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, or a baptism of the Holy Spirit. So how, does, how do we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's not an outward action like being dipped into the water and brought back out again. What is it? Well, I really think the Great Commission, when it says go into all the world and, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, wasn't just talking about water baptism. I really believe that, that the Great Commission was about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can't, baptism of, of, of with water is a precursor, and sometimes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As we've seen in the book of Acts, sometimes the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened before water baptism, as it did in Caesarea Maritima, as, as Peter uh, ministers there. We see the need for the Holy Spirit every time. So how do we receive it? It's a choice. It's a choice to invite the Holy Spirit to have full access to your life and to control the desires of your heart. You guys know the difference, or you should know the difference, between a choice in the moment and a choice for life. I wear a ring on my finger that symbolizes my unbroken bond of love with my wife. It was a choice that I made in a moment, yes. But it's a choice that I make every day to be faithful to her in heart and mind and in action. Prolonged choice. It's a choice of the heart. It's a choice that dictates every single thought and action for the rest of my days. That is the choice that the Holy Spirit is asking for you to make. But just like my wife didn't imprison me or or, or threaten me or whatever else to marry her so the Holy Spirit doesn't do that with us. He gently invites us, and calls to us. But it's a choice that we have to make. It's a choice for a complete surrender. It can't be part way. You know, when the, the disciples received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, um, one of the amazing things about it was as they were there for days, praying and seeking God before the Holy Spirit actually came and they had this sanctifying baptism of the Holy Spirit experience. You know, maybe you've prayed this prayer before and you just haven't received it. Sometimes God has to work out all those issues in your heart before he can fully come in. If you know John Wesley's story, he, he recognized on a ship coming back from missionary work in, in, in the colonies that would one day become North America and the United States, the Moravians were fearless in the midst of a storm on a boat. And so he didn't, he didn't have um, that full sanctifying baptism of the Holy experience until later after he'd processed what was going on and his need and his desire. And, and so he had that Aldersgate 
experience later on. And so, maybe for you, God is working through all those issues. You have to lay them down one by one by one. And he's saying, I hear you. I hear you're saying you want to be fully mine and fully surrendered. But let's look at this. Let's look at this. Let's look at this. Jesus himself, when the rich young man came to him and said, I want to follow you. He said, well, do all these things. And he said, I've done it without sin. Jesus looked on him in love and said, well, go sell all you have and give to the poor. Follow me. And the man walked away destitute. Not because Jesus didn't want him, but because Jesus called to full surrender. Choice of full surrender, guy. Hold nothing back. Here in Acts 19, the Holy Spirit arrives and immediately enables those that invited him in to prophesy and speak in tongues. They were saying prophetic words. They're speaking in languages that they haven't learned. We're not told if this is some sort of angelic language or if this is some sort of uh, ability to speak languages that they didn't learn like the day on Pentecost. And the day on Pentecost, the disciples, like Peter, were unable to speak multiple la- different languages at one time. So everybody that was listening heard the gospel in their own language. We're not told one way or the other. This can be a confirmation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't happen this way every time. Either way, for whatever reason, that's how it occurred in this moment. How do you know that you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How do you know? You have a greater peace and assurance. How do you explain peace? That restlessness, that fear is gone. I can attest to that. I don't worry about death any longer. I don't worry about my salvation. I know my Father's love for me. In fact, I know how much I need Him. And it's not like I'm some superhuman uh, that, that is without sin. No, it's, it's this beautiful dependence upon Him. I have a peace and an assurance because I talk to Him every day. And I listen to His voice. And it's this ongoing relationship. It's not something that's distant. something that's very near. You have a greater passion for God's Word. Before, it, it, it's hard to get in God's Word. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't connect. You fall asleep while reading it, or you just, just get bored. You zone out. With the Holy Spirit in you, you've got to remember He inspired the, the authors to write the words of God on parchment. He protected that Word, and He reveals that Word to us today. You've got a greater passion for God's Word. And you have a more sensitivity to the guidance of God in your daily life. I think sometimes we give our conscience too much credit. Many times I think our conscience is literally the Holy Spirit saying, no, 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 not that way, or go this way, or see that person, pray for them, or whatever else. There's a sensitivity, there's an awareness that God is orchestrating things around you all day, and you are kind of excited constantly for what God's going to show you next. And you have the power to say no to sin. You know, I I think all the way back to the Garden of Eden. All this mess that we've gone through in this world, I think would be different if Adam and Eve would have remembered when the serpent was tempting them that they could have just gone to God and say, hey Father, can you clear up this mess? Because we got this disagreement going on the snake saying one thing but we're thinking something else can you bring some clarity here in our moments of temptation where we do not have the power to say no where we fall in time and time and time again if we call out to the holy spirit and say please oh his presence and power fall and where there was no way before god parts the water and gives us dry land We live in a day and an age where we must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Remember that baptism isn't just about cleaning. Even in water baptism, it's a death to your old life and it's a coming out of a new. Who you were before this choice dies. And what comes out is something new and clean. I love love the story of Naaman. This foreigner 
this general that, that probably was guilty of many atrocious acts gets leprosy and comes to the prophet and says, I want to be clean. And he says, bathe in the Jordan seven times. And he says, that filthy thing, I don't want to bathe in that. And his servant begs him to do it. He does it. When he comes out that last time, that leprosy. The baptism of the Holy Spirit will wash away the cancer that's killing you. As we've been studying for over a year now, the early church was being formed during a tumultuous time around the globe. I don't think our time is any less tumultuous. This is not a time for God's people to flounder and struggle and suffer. This is a time where God's people need to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, walk in victory and triumph, and let our praises be what bring people to Jesus. This is a perfect time for the Holy Spirit to be seen in and around us because we see in the book of Acts that it was the perfect time for the gospel. Folks, let me encourage you today, and I'm going to pray with you here in a second. Let the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, be in the core of your being. Jesus, I pray for my friends and my relatives and my loved ones acquaintances and people that are hearing this message that I don't even know. Pray for my church family that we would not stop until we receive the full gospel message. And that full gospel message, Lord, is that you have made a way for us to have the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to be a part of our life, to dwell in the core of our being, to to lay the foundation of a new life in Christ and you. To give us the power to say no to sin. To enable us to know our path every, to, every day. To, to give us the words that we need to say. To give us a hunger of your word. To change our thoughts and desires. To make us powerful where we were powerless. Jesus, that is what we need today. That's why you've led us to the, in the book of Acts. Before all of this pandemic hit. Before all of this political chaos went on. Before all of this, you said... Listen, I want you to study what I did at the foundation of the church. The key following you, Holy Spirit. So right now, Holy Spirit, I know that you're whispering in my heart. Saying, let me lead. Will you give me full control? Give me the keys to the house of your life. You let me be the one to clean you and change you and transform you. The full gospel, Lord. We're not called to live defeated lives full of fear, wondering if we're saved or not until we die. We're called to know in the core of our being. We're called to be bold no matter the circumstance. We're called to love. And we're called to worship. Lord God, let your people worship. I I see clearly, and I've seen it from our intercessors team, Lord. You're calling the church, every single one of us, to march around the walls of Jericho, worshiping you and praising you in this season, so that those who might be enemies of the faith can see that you are not defeated. They may laugh at us, they may mock us, Inwardly, Lord God, they are being destroyed by fear and you are going to tear walls down so that the gospel can spread around the world in our day and an age. God, Jesus, you're coming soon. We know this. Set us ablaze. Fill us with your spirit. Amen. Before you turn off this video, Let me encourage you to pray yourself, just you and the Holy Spirit, and invite them in. I also encourage you to share this video with others. Share it to your Facebook page or someone else. Someone needs to hear this. It's up to you to do it. An easy thing you can do. I love you, church. I hope to see you face-to-face soon. Uh, Hopefully this is just a short-term thing that we're, we're doing here. But walk in victory. The light in the Lord give you the desires.